I know you guys got all excited when you saw we were going to talk about ethics this week, but I like to use this analogy to describe the importance of ethics. I have a convertible Mustang, and my husband, uh, he has a four-door pickup. So when we want to do something fun or excited, we put the top down and go for a drive in my car. But when we need to haul something, when we need to pull a trailer, um, when we need to take off the trash or any other kind of work, we use the truck. So my point is that ethics or even learning about research in general may not be as exciting as some of the other psychology courses like abnormal psych or child psych, I don't know, whatever whatever particular branch you find the most exciting, but those courses wouldn't be possible, or at least they wouldn't be the same courses without research. And so this course is very important. And without ethics, research wouldn't be something that we can be proud of. Um, you guys all know about little Albert, and you may also know about the Tuscany, uh, Tuskegee, sorry, um, experiment that was done, I think it started back in 1939, uh, 32, where there was a 40-year project that, while it wasn't psychology, was still administered by the American government. And they literally allowed 400 African-American men to suffer from um, syphilis just to watch how the disease progressed. There was also during, oh, probably the same time, uh, it was from 1939, um, a monster study. And while, again, it wasn't done by a psychologist, it was um, done by a speech expert because they wanted to test their theory that children became stutters because of psychological pressure. And so they took a bunch of orphans and tried to make the ones that didn't stutter start stuttering. So these are just a few of, of the many horrible types of things that we hear about. Um, as far as things that happened prior to um, having ethics in psychology. The first code of ethics was written not necessarily to protect research. In fact, they really didn't have very much mention of research at all, but it was written in response to increased uh, professional activity and public visibility of its members before and after World War II. In 1947, the first APA Committee on Ethical Standards for Psychologists was appointed, and the committee was actually chaired by a man named Edward Tolman, who wanted to create a code of ethics for psychologists that would actually be usable. They were committed to producing professional standards that would provide psychologists with a set of values and practical techniques for identifying and resolving moral problems. To achieve these goals, the committee decided to draw on the knowledge of the field to develop a process of developing a code that would be effective in modifying human behavior. Drawing on the knowledge of group processes, um, the committee decided they were going to um, use a procedure called critical incident method, and they surveyed the entire membership of the APA. Of course, there were only about 7,500 members at that time, and they surveyed them about what they called incidents that they knew about firsthand, in which a psychologist had made a decision having ethical implications to indicate what they perceived <clears throat> as being the ethical issue involved. There were more than a thousand such incidents that were reported by APA members. And they put all these together and they were reviewed by a second committee. And the members um, identified some major ethical themes that emerged from the incidents.